Everyone talked about how old they were during Oslo, and my problem is that I, I have a problem with that. So I will just say that I was on the southern uh, lawn of the White House while the Oslo Accords were signed. I was the intelligence attaché at the Washington Emb at the embassy, Israeli embassy in Washington. I was in the audience on the lawn of the White House. And what I remember at the time, and that takes me back to the argument between Effie and Yair, what I remember is that the main thing that was typical of the Israeli participants and the audience on the lawn that afternoon was that there was a lot of tension between the Paris, Paris people and Rabin's people, and that was, was very characteristic of the event. And no one really cared about the Palestinians. It was kind of an abstract concept. There were the Paris people who were very excited, and it was a festive day, the day of a, dr a dream coming true. And then there were Rabin's people who felt that they had been forced into the situation and that they were there um, against their will to a certain extent. And that was what that was what I felt. Maybe I, I might have been mistaken, but that's that, that that was my those were my feelings at the time. I remember the arguments about where to sit. The Robin people wanted to sit further back. I remember that 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 was a moment that was typical of that event of that time. And after the signing, I went to the George Washington University along with a senior Egyptian journalist and member and a member of the American Con uh, Congress. Along with these two people, we went together and we talked about the Oslo Accords. And I said that and this takes us to our discussion. I said that because of the agreement, I was wearing a uniform at the time. I said that because of the agreement, we and the Palestinians are on the same ship, the same boat, and Arafat's nature is to drill a hole in the boat and then we'll all drown together. And it's a great risk, and if Arafat, Arafat doesn't do so, contrary to his nature, then we'll reach the safe shores. But if he doesn't, then we'll all drown. At the time, I was the most moderate speaker uh, regarding Arafat at the time, even the Egyptian journalist and the member of the American Congress, their main message was, are you crazy? Who signs agreements with Arafat? And I find, found myself defending our policy that was giving peace a chance, etc. And that was the situation. And uh, now we're talking about what the Palestinians did with that agreement, how did they understand it, and the direction in which they ta took it. And I understand that it is an internal discussion, but they're definitely part of the agreement as well, and it's in important to talk about what they did with it. And we, are, we have here a battery of people who have a lot to say about this topic. And thank you to all of the organizers of this very important conference and for this extraordinary opportunity for to express diverse opinions. I attended the first and second panels. I think it's very important to have this discussion. It's very unfortunate that the that there uh, that it's very rare to have a diverse panel that challenges one another. And I want to thank you for this conference. I will speak, begin in Hebrew, and then speak a little bit in English about the legal about the legal system. Uh, but I want to begin by talking about something that I think is very critical. It's a question that came up. Gershon mentioned it in his introductory comments this morning. The question is, what is the goal of the state of Israel? 75 years after its establishment, and what is the purpose, what is the vision of the Declaration of Independence that we talk about all the time, and I think that the Declaration of Independence has been recruited for a certain side in the argument without it, without discussion. This morning, Enat Wolf, Wolf talked a little bit about secular Zionism and uh, Dec uh, 
the Declaration of Independence talks about Zionism being the realization of years of prayer and uh, for the return to Zion. And in this 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 prophecy document that talks about the, uh, the Jewish identity of the state of Israel that is a democratic regime, regime with a democratic regime. And what the this defining document that says is that it will be a Jewish state of Jewish-born people because the institutions play have a significant role in what happens when it comes to demonization and double standards. This is a Jewish nation that was born in this in the land of Israel and returned to the land of Israel after thousands of years of persecution, and it is a, reg a, stand a land that is committed to uh, that is committed to equality. In my opinion, so secular Zionism is an oxymoron when it comes to the Declaration of Independence, and when I refer to the text, it's very clear. And I don't, I don't want to deviate from the topic on, at hand, but I do want to talk about the historical opportunity, as I said, in the miracle of the state of Israel, the state of the Jewish nation that returned to its historical homeland after thousands of years of persecution and is committed to equality in the land of Israel. And I think that also is a defining moment in that history. It is connected to the failures of the Yom Kippur War and may also uh, be connected in the future, in the historical context, to the situation today uh, and the question of whether it is a legal reform or a revolt. I served, I grew up in Canada, I served in Israel, I came to Israel alone, served in the army, and I studied law in Hebrew University, I did my internship in the Supreme Court, and I wanted to go back to uh, talking about what is happening today on our streets at the time of Oslo, there was also what is called today a constitutional reform. We can't forget for a moment that that is an acute moment, as was said before, the connection between international media and local media. Here, too, the inherent connection between international law and domestic law. I'm not looking at my notes now because of, uh, uh, just looking at my notes just give me confidence that I don't the thanks for picking them up for me. The inherent connection that I want to make, and I'm sure Isabella will talk more about it, arming the uh, uh, use, uh, the uh, Oslo Accords were violated from the moment they were signed and arm, uh, uh, misuse of the system and uh, in the, con uh, the context of international law for the UN, for example, and what is happening within the local discourse and understanding of the legal system and what the role of the legal system is. I will argue that the goal is apolitical or above politics and the law cannot be applied selectively because selective application of any principle pulls the rug out from under our feet. We can't um, apply any principles selectively, including international law, and I'll talk to that briefly. There is nothing about Oslo, including its very infrastructure, that has not been violated from the moment it was signed. And I said, as a young legal uh, member of the legal system, I was a student who had bought my first car. It was a Ford Fiesta. It was an old car. And when we stopped at a red light at the time, we started calculating, should we stand, stand we wait closer to a bus, or how far we should be from the bus, so that when the bus explodes, avoid avoid the bus being exploding exploding on us when we stop behind the bus at a red light. And I'm explaining, telling you that because I want to tell the younger people here how clear it was to us, how it was at the front of our minds. And also Arafat's decision to push uh, this elder, an elderly Jewish man on, in a wheelchair. And I'm, I'm noting this because I'm connecting it to, I'm making a connection to the unspoken link 
about what Israel is as the state of a Jewish nation. There is not a single Jew in the world doesn't who didn't remember Leon King Ofer at the time, and I'm sure there are many Israelis who had never heard of Leon King Ofer, and that is a defining moment in the Oslo violations of the Oslo Accords, because when, uh, when Arafat signed the agreement and was brought in as a leader who uh, spoke in Arabic, who in Arabic he spoke completely differently, and at the time we needed Khaled or someone else to translate his speeches for us, arming the legal system didn't even necessitate the use of changing the language. What it meant was that you can use the legal system, international legal law, and that was built on the ashes of the Holocaust and was slowly pulling the rug out, of, uh, out from under its feet. And I think that that is where we stood at the time. That is where we stand now. Actually subjecting Israel to the uh, alleged war crimes and by definition the unilateral move uh, approaching the ICC by the Palestinians and I remind us all the principles of justiciability and complementarity all of them thrown to the wind those foundational principles of international law not to mention reciprocity which was never expected of the Palestinians and I believe in many ways in a soft racism of low expectations what can you expect and it's still with us today so what can you expect? You can expect, when you're using the foundational principles of international law, that they be applied equally and consistently, because you understand that selective application of those principles undermines the entire infrastructure. I can give multiple additional examples. I'm sure that Isabella will dive deeper into the education, the inculcation of anti-Semitic hate, direct anti-Semitic hate. Of course, pay for slay in complete violation of the Taylor Force Act in the United States of America and the education, the consistent education of young children, which how would you expect any different, which organizations like Impact SE and NGO Monitor has shown the direct consequence, not just on anti-Semitism that targets Jews around the world, but obviously results in terror in the state of Israel with a continued commitment to the annihilation of the state of Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people, founded after millennia of exile and persecution, committed to equality. If we don't accept that premise, we can accept nothing else and, of course, to the murder of Jews around the world. So if I just end on one little hopeful note, and I don't want to take up any more time, I do believe that the paradigmal shift inherent to the Abraham Accords, which in many ways, and in the panel before, I, I'd say to say the least, was accepted very chillingly. Because the paradigmal shift inherent to the Abraham Accords says the following. It says, without the inversion or the complete shift of what we know of as the three no's of Khartoum, no to recognition of Israel, no to negotiation with Israel, no to peace with Israel. Without that inversion, there can be no peace. If I said to you, I do not accept your right to exist, but let's negotiate the terms of our coexistence, and maybe we'll have some peace, or even worse, Oslo, let's make peace. Then we're going to negotiate the terms of that peace, and then we'll see if we recognize your right to exist and if we have mutual recognition. Well, what's inherent to the Abraham Accords, in addition to, of course, what their name speaks to and attests to, which is that our shared values far, far um, uh, over, uh, uh, um, uh, I'd say, are, are far greater than what sets us apart. What's important in those Abraham Accords is that they say, paradigmal shift, the transition or the pivot from rejectionism, all out rejection of the state of Israel to exist as what it was founded to be. Declaration of independence, the return of an indigenous people after millennia of exile and persecution committed to equality. It says first recognition of that right to exist and then negotiation of the coexistence and ultimately the paving path for peace. And if you would ask me, that is the path to peace first and foremost with the Palestinians, not to mention within Israel, between Arabs and Jews, and not to mention, obviously, with other countries in the region. Um, and I hope that Isabella will di dig down, I'm sure she will, deeper into that deep anti-Semitic virulent hate, which we see on campuses today, in which Zionism is racism, 1975 UN resolution, and 2001 Durban 
Israel's an apartheid state is alive and well. So if I come back from a campus tour speaking at NYU and Rutgers and Yale, and the greeting that I receive to my talk on anti-Semitism is Zionists not welcome, we have to understand Zionism is racism is the reality on university campuses today. Israel's an apartheid state is a given for many, including international journalists. And that is what we're up against at this 75th opportunity and moment, including of Oslo. Thank you. I'm always so delighted to listen to Michal. It is like cool water. I would add to that the fact that Israelis simply didn't understand what was happening to them. They thought that in the letter that Arafat sent to Rabin on September 9th, 1993, he accepted Israel. He did this move that you talked about. They thought he had done that. Whereas in the Palestinian sophistication that many have tried to take the willful blindness approach to and to others it was just real blindness there wasn't willful blindness some people were willfully blind they knew the truth but they wanted to ignore it others were really truly blind because they didn't understand what he meant those who didn't understand knew that they needed to well, didn't know what khidibia was it needed to be explained which is the basis that the quran is based on but people who don't understand a certain culture like the Islamic culture and are negotiating with the Muslims without understanding what this term means. People who didn't understand that when Arafat said that he recognizes Israel, he didn't say that Israel is a Jewish state. The Palestinians were always busy presenting this letter, the letter by Truman, where the word Jewish state was deleted in favor of Israel to show that the Americans too did not recognize Israel as a Jewish state. So these are really the roots of the culture and of the Palestinian recognition of Israel. And, and you talked about that when you talked about the media. No one in the media raised this subject. Professor Yehoshua Porat was the only one who came up to Rabin and said to him, listen, you have, they're pulling the wool over your eyes. And then they really looked at uh, the, the convention. So this again reflects the willful blindness. And we all woke up ultimately from this reverie, but uh, it, took, it took us different amounts of time to do that. Some only woke up during the second intifada. It took them a long time to wake up. Uh, amazed I over the last few years and amazed constantly on a daily basis is the extent to which the conversation on the American left, which is expanding really now into the mainstream about Israel and, and, and Zionism, um, really repeats the tropes, the motifs, and the explanatory logic of the anti Israel propaganda that the Soviet Union conducted from 1967 all the way through the end of of the USSR. So that continued for you know for the entire uh, 20 decades, uh, and the Soviet propaganda pushed the ideas that precisely you were talking about: Zionism is racism, and Zion and Israel is an apartheid state, and a complete, really complete demonization of Zionism and Israel to the global left. And it did it through multiple channels. It did it through its massive foreign media apparatus. It distributed these ideas in dozens of languages in over a hundred countries around the world. Uh, they worked through the, their embassies to communicate these ideas to various groups in the populations, you know, in the UK, in, in the US, in France, really all over the world. Uh, they used the academy to legitimize their propaganda, and we'll talk about that more about that in a moment. They worked directly with left-wing parties in the, US, in the US and the UK. They worked by a system of friendship societies that existed around the globe. And they acquired agents of influence who would say these same things on, the, on their behalf without looking like it came from the USSR. Now, why is it important? It's important because this, these ideas about Israel and Zionism, the de demonizing ideas about Israel and Zionism, really took root in certain parts of Western societies and certainly the developing world already in the 70s and 80s. And so today, when you know the Palestinian cause becomes elevated also to the cause celebre, basically, among the, the global left, already in those years, if you look at the newspapers from those years, uh, you see how that happens. And so I think that background is really important to understand 
why this demonizing language lands so well in contemporary uh, universities, right? Because the, the ground had already been prepared. So one of the things, I think one way to illustrate it is actually to look at Mahmoud Abbas's, at some aspects of Mahmoud Abbas's biography. I think a lot of people here, maybe everybody knows that he um, defended his PhD in Moscow. So I want to talk about that a little bit. I wrote an article about that for Tablet. Actually, a lot of people, there's been a lot of interest in the dissertation and a lot of people have written about it. Actually, there, but there are a lot of inaccuracies. And I think the inaccuracies come from the fact that a lot of people have used the book that he wrote based on his dissertation instead of the dissertation itself. Now, the dissertation itself is actually unavailable. unavailable. It's uh, kept under lock and key at the Institute of Oriental Studies in Moscow, and it's only if you have, if you're staff of the Institute, you can get the full, uh, the full text. Uh, but you can get it right here uh, at the um, National Library of Israel, you can get a 19-page abstract of the dissertation. It's something that in the USSR they produced. It includes the literature review. It includes all the people who directed his work. So you can understand where his ideas come from. It's a really fascinating document. And so one of the first mistakes that people make when they talk about his dissertation is that he defended it at the Institute of the Friendship of the Peoples in Moscow. He actually defended it at the Institute of Oriental Studies. He was enrolled at the Institute, at, at the Institute of the Friendship of the Peoples, but he defended it at the Institute Institute of Oriental Studies. Why is that important? Because the Institute of Oriental Studies at the time for, was headed by Yevgeny Primakov, a very important figure in Soviet Zionology, let's put it that way, the kind of these uh, demonizing studies of Zionism. He was an important person in the intelligence, in Soviet intelligence. He eventually became the, um, the Russian Prime Minister. So the Institute of Oriental Studies was a crucial element in what the Soviets began to call a scientific anti-Zionism in the early 70s. So there was a centralized effort to create a system of academic institutions that would create knowledge, that would support the propaganda, the anti-Zionist and anti-Israel propaganda. They, they established relationships with different organizations abroad that could work with them, that could support their ideas. One of these organizations, some of them, they were mostly, of course, organizations and countries that followed the Soviet line. So one of them was the Palestine Studies Center uh, that was located in Beirut. There are others in Poland, in the GDR. And you know all of this, and you see all of this reflected in Abbas's dissertation. Now, what is Abbas's dissertation about? The title is uh, the Zionist, Zionist relationship with the Zionist Nazi relationship in 1933 to 1945. What is he trying to do in that dissertation? When you look at it, you really see how it just follows in the footsteps of Soviet propaganda. It talks about Israel as a colonial state. It talks about it talks about uh, Zionism being an imperialist uh, project. And it proposes this story that we hear today on the left still. If you look at what uh, people around Jeremy Corbyn say, people like uh, Ken Livingston, this, this whole story, I don't know if you've, if you've heard it, maybe it's only those who, who follow the obsessions of the far left that know it, but, but, the, but the, the use of the story of, um, of, uh, Kastner's, of the Kastner story to demonize Israel, to, to say that Zionists actually wanted to work with the Nazis. Zionists actually were guilty of, uh, of they, they were participants in the Holocaust. The Zionist leadership in Palestine, in fact, wanted for the Holocaust to happen because then that would accelerate the creation of the state. And they also wanted, they wanted to maybe rescue the young, but they wanted for the old to go into the ovens. I mean, it's a truly just obscene and demonizing language. And that all comes from the USSR and that all lands in uh, in the writings and in the newspapers uh, of the global left and of the developing world in the 70s and in the 80s. And as you can see, the stories continue to live through today. So it's a, it's a complete and total demonization and destruction of reputation and, and character. Uh, the, uh, the dissertation is a, it's a profanation of scholarship. I mean, if you follow uh, the footnotes, if you look, which, which I've done, you know, it, it's a complete distortion of, the con of context, complete distortion of quotes. So it's not a scholarly work in, every, in any way, shape, or form. It's a complete uh, political project. But you can see, so here they invest in one person. Why am I focusing on this? Because we're, of course, talking about the uh, PA, but also, you know, it's just one example of how the Soviets invested in one person who then goes on and succeeds and becomes really influential and can bring his ideas to global 
global audiences. Um, another arm, uh, an, an, another reason that Abbas's dissertation is, is um, relevant here, or Abbas's biography is relevant here, and I'm going to finish on this point, is that uh, he was the chair of the Palestine Soviet Friendship Society. It's rarely mentioned because people usually don't understand what it means. Well, there was a system of, uh, of friendship societies all around the world. Their work was guided from Moscow, and I just spent a little bit of time in London recently looking at the workings of the British Soviet Friendship Society. I mean, it was, it's just incredible, you know, they put out their own publication, they worked closely hand in hand with the Soviet embassy, they had branches all over the country, including at Oxford, and they would just communicate Soviet propaganda, including Soviet propaganda about Israel and Zionism and Jews. And so this is the background that I think we, we need to be aware of. I think that people do not realize, they're not aware of the extent to which Abu Mazen to this day continues to promote these views. He has a committee for struggling against Israel's legitimacy which convenes every so often and he believes that he is very successful in this activity. He looks around at what's happening in universities as was explained here and he thinks that he is really promoting the Palestinian issue at the expense of Israel's legitimacy. He is doing that and you can read about what I write about the Palestinian narrative. Abu Mazen wrote about this not only in his doctoral dissertation, in the book that followed it, but also in his book Zionism Beginning and End, which he wrote in 1977 and which was republished in 2012. And there again he repeats the narrative. He continues to see himself fighting Israel's legitimacy as a Jewish state, even if he is willing to have some sort of interim um, transitional compromise. Bauch, we'll go to you. Okay, so I was given permission by Yossi to talk about the breaching of the violation by the Palestinians from a different perspective. I want to present how I think that the PA is providing is preventing it from ever being a partner in the future based on its capabilities and how it is breaching its ability to ever be a partner. And again, it's questionable if we can even be considered a partner at this state and time. And the fact that the way that it was prevented from being a partner or partner, that is what I would like to talk about. I am not going to talk about the role of Israel in the, the condition of the PA because I don't want to sound political. I want to talk about what the PA does to itself and to the environment in which it operates. I think that the question is if there is any type of political horizon that, the, that, is, that is to be lacking among within the PA, in that case, can the PA be sustainable and a partner for Israel, we will talk about the dream and it's be and it being shattered. I want to tell, warn you not to walk around barefoot because we are constantly seeing these visions being shattered. What is very relevant to the situation of the PA in 2023 and in the near future, the PA is always affected by what is happening in our neighborhood. It is developing its Palestinian proxy from the Iranian perspective and recruit in order to prevent it. Further, uh, um, Iran is developing the Palestinian proxy to keep Israel out of what is doing in Syria and is trying to become involved with the Iranian agenda. We saw Abu Mazen, despite the protests in the Sunni world and within Hamas itself, and we see what's happening in the north, is, when it, which is not relevant for this forum. For the past two years, we have seen the Palestinian proxy, Hamas, the Islamic Jihad, Al-Aqsa, and Fatah, all entrenching themselves in Jenin, going from there to 
to to Akarim and other places, and we may see them elsewhere as well in the future. And these are all at the expense of its ability to be to be legitimate and to take control, to have to be a government in Israel. Abu Mazen recently fired the majority of of the leaders of the government, and a few years ago he fired the, all of the security defense leaders who failed in the operation in Jenin. So the PA reflects, this is something that is reflected for the last 12 years that Abu Mazen has been completely illegitimate and just recently in 2021 he canceled the Palestinian elections for this, not for the first time. So let's talk about Abu Mazen's legacy to see if there's any type of national uh, a national future that can, uh, can be a, p a future partner for Israel. This is a, uh, Abu Mazen is responsible for dismantling Fatah. Marwan is in jail, but his people are not, are being discriminated against. Taufik and Jabril Rajub is angry. Arafat is also responsible for the fact that if Abu Mazen is responsible for the fact that in 2021 there were 25 Fatah lists that competed against one another in 2006 when we when there were the last elections for the Palestinian parliament many people voted against Fatah today Hamas has 76 representatives in the parliament and Fatah has much fewer he is responsible for breaking the homeland, for destroying the homeland. There is, it is not, lead, not, it is not running the situation in Gaza or in many parts of the West Bank, not in East Jerusalem. <laughs> it is questionable no, whether there is any power, any control in Hebron and other areas as well. Uh, Abu Mazen has become a burden on the Palestinian people. Eighty percent consider him corrupt. And there is very often um, preference to uh, to Ismail Haniya over Abu Mazen, but when Barghouti runs, he receives 70% of the votes, leaving Abu Mazen and Haniya crumbs. Uh, Abu Mazen is responsible for the fact that the Palestinian problem, as they call it, is something very inferior compared to what Israel is doing in the Arab world. The question is: Is the well an agreement? between Israel and, so and Saudi Arabia that is not based on the Saudi Arabian initiative, it is, this is something that also puts the Palestinian issue on the sidelines. And when, they can when he canceled the elections in 2021, he and the parliament that he no longer has are not relevant and there are no laws, the parliament is non-functional. Abu Mazen is the one who places sanctions on a half of the Palestinian nation in the Gaza Strip, causing them to rebel against Hamas. He is responsible from the perspective of the people in the Gaza Strip for being for the starvation situation there. Abu Mazen is completely illegitimate there in the Gaza Strip. You heard the numbers as well, and, uh, and Abu Mazen is responsible for all that. When we look at the near future, if possible, Hamas has a strategy that is very, very clear, and I call it the I call this stra Hamas strategy the everything is legitimate to oppose to postpone the revol the re re the uh, retaliation against the assassinations to get IDF out of the way three times in the last few years when there was a need to break the homeland and kill the Fatah leaders in 2007, that is also legitimate. When there is a need to collaborate with the Iranians, the Farsi, the Shiites, and not as opposed to the Egyptians and other Sunnis, that's legitimate. When you want to be a proxy, a Nasrallah's proxy, just the other day we met with Nasrallah, that is legitimate as well. When there is a need to negotiate with the Zionists, about the suitcases of Qatari money, that is legitimate as well. That is the Hamas strategy. When there is a need to beg Syria that assassinated its own people, that murdered its own people, when there is a need to reject Oslo, Oslo but join the Palestinian parliament that was created by Oslo, that is legitimate to Hamas as well. Hamas has a strategy and it made an enormous step by joining the Iranian axis 
and entrenching itself in Lebanon, that is entrenching itself in Lebanon. Musa Abu Mazouk said specifically that we are here to be irreversible. Uh, Auri says, the Hamas leader says that, cra that crashing the Palestinian Authority is one of our goals. And what does that tell us for the near future? After Abu Mazen, and that doesn't start at midnight, it starts sometime in the morning, and we're now sometime we're in the twilight. The day after Abu Mazen is already here, as we have heard. So there's really, it'll really be out of the picture very soon. And we have to understand the picture, the map. Where does Abu Mazen still have control? Only in the central Judea and Samaria, nowhere else. The armed groups, Hamas, Halalim, I counted over 35 armed groups. There's been, uh, Abu Mazen is accused by his people of destroying the economy, the the opportunity and it was given by Benny Gantz made him made him illegitimate once again because he accepted economic peace at the ex at the expense of political 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 agreement. And when we talk about what you, the Palestinians, think are the rights is the right solution, they say elections, but survey, but the polls show that they won't necessarily win. The polls show that they won't necessarily even vote. They won't. They show that even if Hamas wins, they might. They won't. Hamas won't necessarily. Uh, the PA won't necessarily accept the uh, results of the elections. Maran and Dachlun and Rajub, Tirawi and the Abu Jihad people, I can't see them sitting together. I can't see that happening. And if they do sit together, will that last? Will that be sustainable? When they talk about two solution, uh, the two-state solution, my teacher, Ruben Gubba, said that their, uh, their goal, they say that their goal is what we translate as to a two-state solution, but what Abu Mazen is really stating, saying is that the Jews that come from Russia are Russian, the people, the Jews who came from Ethiopia are Ethiopians. I don't see a Jewish nation. Abu Mazen talk, doesn't talk about the end of the conflict that's not even on the table. And when I look towards the future and think about the Palestinian Authority after Abu Mazen, it mostly placed a question mark regarding the state of Israel. Would you do? Would you sign a financial agreement with a partner of this kind? I would say no, and I think that is where Oslo has taken us and the direction in which it will take us in the future. Okay, I would like to talk about the Oslo Agreement itself. I accompanied this agreement very closely from its inception and even before. I don't know if you know that the biggest scoop that there were secret talks in Oslo I published in Al Hamishmar three months before it became clear and then the media said how is it that Pinchas in Bari reported it and we didn't notice so I know this process from even before it began when it was all only in its pregnancy stages a turning point, as far as I was concerned, when I understood what was happening at Oslo was when I was in Tunisia and I met PLO members after the Kuwait war. The PLO was down in the dumps. The offices were closed. They were sitting in backyards. And I had a wonderful opportunity. I didn't need to schedule an appointment. I simply went to the PLO backyard and there I could meet whoever I wanted. And I learned so many things during those opportunities. I saw that just as we had Paris and Rabin, in the PLO too, there were disagreements, huge disputes about the peace with Israel. There was the tough core of Arafat and Cooper just rightly indicated Arafat and these hardliners from the classic PLO who didn't want peace with Israel. And there was the younger generation. Among them, surprisingly, 
the leader of the Democratic Liberal Front, Mamdouh Naufal, who was the one responsible for the massacre in Malot, if you remember, and he was in favor of the agreement, he was in favor of peace with Israel, and he warned me back then about Arafat. He said back then already, beware of Arafat. Arafat will fail the entire project. He'll make it all fail. Now, over the years, I got to know Abu Allah. And from my own personal impression, he did want this agreement. He wanted it. Now, what were the disagreements within the PLO? and within the, Palest the Palestinian leadership, it's what do we want? Do we want a Palestinian state in the 1967 borders, or do we want the right of return? Two very different things. And the person who dictated the right of return was Arafat. And his dogmatic leadership, like Sakhar Khabash, if you remember these names, these dinosaurs from the dinosaur era, they dictated a line for the PLO that objected to a Palestinian state. And why? Because if we agree to a Palestinian state, then it's the 1967 borders, and we are actually giving up on the right of return. And so it took us time to understand that. And I, too, even though I heard them talk about it with my own ears, I, too, took time to understand that, to internalize it, to digest it. And I started listening to Arafat, how Arafat speaks, what he says. And Arafat said, he said it to us, and he, we didn't want to hear it. What did Arafat say? I brought some quotes. In his own speeches, we heard it and we ignored it. We heard it and when people say that he spoke sometimes in English, sometimes in Arabic, that's exactly classic Arafat behavior. When he spoke in English, he talked to Europeans because he wanted to get them on his side. And so he said what they wanted to hear. He said they wanted to hear a Palestinian state. Okay, Udrub, why not? Let's, let's go. He would speak in texts in order to gain European sympathy, because if, they w if he were to say to them what he said in Arabic, they would have thrown him down the stairs. Now, everyone knows what you mentioned, the Khudibia and the Jihad in, Johann in Johannesburg. He said that to our face. But in every one of his speeches, every time he spoke, there were completely different messages. Arafat was a Muslim, he was religious, he spoke about Muslim content, and he was an Arab nationalist. And I say Arab nationalist, not a Palestinian nationalist, because his vision was a pan-Arab vision. It was the Arab Empire. And he said that to Uri Avneri, according to what Imad Shakur wrote in his article about the meeting between Uri Avneri and Arafat. Imad Shakur wrote that Avneri came to him talking about the Palestinian state and he answered the Muslim Empire, the Arab Empire. But what did come out of the meeting between Arafat and Uri Avneri? Arafat understood what the Europeans wanted to hear from Uri Avneri. They wanted to hear about a Palestinian state. Okay, why not? Let them. But he didn't speak in Arabic about it. In Arabic, he said Muslim content. Now, in order to understand what Arafat said, you must know Islam. I learned about Islam in university not modern Middle East, but Islam. And I heard the verses that he was quoting, and I understood that we don't understand what he's talking about. For instance, the delegitimization. That's already Arafat, who was, who was laying the foundation of Islam for, for delegitimization. 
legitimization because he was saying things that sounded trivial, that sounded obvious, that the Palestinians are a heroic nation. What does that mean in the, in the Quran? It's the Canaanites. So the Palestinians are Canaanites. And that was the beginning, that was the journey, that, that was the entire Palestinian Canaanite project that later developed. Now when he, he said that Palestine is the land of the prophets, great, of course, why not? What, what's wrong with saying that? But these prophets are Muslim prophets according to the Quran. All the prophets are Muslim. There are no other prophets. Jesus is also Palestinian, if you haven't forgotten. So the entire delegitimization project began with Arafat, with the messages that he conveyed in Arabic to those listening to him. Now I know that over the years, Arafat was a leader that you could not contend with overtly. There are no many Palestinian leaders that objected to what Arafat was saying, really objected. And we tried. My friend Danny and I have tried, had tried with very senior leading Palestinian officials to kind of bypass this entire problem, but we failed because on our side, the Israeli side, no one understood what we were doing. So now the question is, now what? What's next? First of all, we must know what we are dealing with. That would be the point of departure, the starting point. Can we continue with the PLO? Let's say toward the Saudi plan. I think not. I think not. I think Arafat has left behind such a legacy that I cannot see a leader who would be able to go against that and say, no, Arafat was wrong, we were wrong. We have to choose between the right of return and a state in 1967 borders. I don't think there is such a leader. Perhaps the current PLO leadership is a leadership comprised of refugees. They are all refugees. And to them, now, again, we don't notice what Abu Mazen is saying. Last year, Abu Mazen appeared in the UN and talked about the borders of the Palestinian state that he wants to declare. 47, that's the year he talked about 47. 47 at least means that there will be an Israeli state, a Jewish state. Now, when we talked about that in the INSS, and they said, no, 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 no. What are you, why are you getting complicated? I'm getting complicated, I'm just saying what Abu Mazen said. You need to become more complicated than that. Thank you, Pinchas. Khaled, how do the Palestinians view the outcomes of this event. Which event? Oslo. First of all, I would like to mention that I too accompanied the Oslo process before and also after. And working on the ground, having worked in the Israeli media and also in the international press, I met Arafat several times and Abu Mazen and most of the high-ranking uh, leaders in of the Palestinians, but before and after the Oslo Accords, and also to cover what was happening on the ground. Now, when we talk about the Oslo Accords, I've noticed that no one has talked about the fact that the Oslo Accords or the Oslo process, the Oslo peace process, came right after the first intifada, or at the height of the first intifada. And therefore, to many in the Palestinian public, the Oslo Accords were perceived as Israeli weakness, as a kind of surrender. Because the people on the street said, voila, we managed with stone throwing and with Molotov cocktails to make Israel 
make concessions that are far-reaching. And therefore the Palestinian public already from day one viewed the Oslo Accords not a peace process. When I hear people talk about the peace process, I always ask myself, where did they get this word from, this term from? Because in Arabic, I've never heard it used. In Arabic, they talked about the Oslo Agreement or Taswiya and not about a peace process. And there's a difference. And therefore, Taswiya is like a solution. Arrangement, not a peace process. Only in Israel, by the way, they called it a peace process. The Palestinians always referred to it as an arrangement or as the Oslo Agreement or Accord. And therefore, the matter of the First Intifada played a key role in terms of many Palestinians, as far as many Palestinians were concerned, the Oslo Accords marked the beginning of an Israeli withdrawal, both on the ground physically and also in terms of the power, the strength, the force. People realized that Israel was tired. People said these Jews can no longer take it. They can't take it anymore. They're starting to pave roads that bypass these areas, and that's why they have signed this agreement. So that's in terms of the average uh, Palestinian Joe. As for um, Arafat, this was great timing, and Pinchas indicated this. I covered East Jerusalem, and I worked at a local newspaper a local Yedi Otachronot newspaper before the Oslo Accords were signed, and I covered East Jerusalem. And I can tell you that in 1992 and 1993, we started to notice signs of PLO weakness, the outer branches of uh, the PLO. What happened? Most of the Arab countries stopped their financial support of PLO because PLO was supportive of Saddam Hussein. And when the PLO weakened financially, it lost much of its support in East Jerusalem and in the West Bank. People who did not dare to speak against the PLO and Yasser Arafat for the first time in 1992 and 1993 started to speak up. Newspapers that were identified with the PLO, Al Fajr, Al Shab, and one more closed down. I worked as a translator in Al Fajr newspaper. In 1992, the newspaper was shut down. We were told that the Kuwaitis and the Gulf states have stopped their financial support. In terms of the PLO, the Oslo Accords were like a lifeline. When many of the PLO senior officials returned or came to Gaza and Jericho at the beginning, I met some of them. And they, of course, never talked about the peace process. They kept trying to make excuses or to explain why they had to sign this agreement. And one of the explanations that kept repeating, that kept coming up, was we were weak. The Arab countries had turned their backs to us. They stopped their financial support of us. The Arabs had betrayed us. What do you want from us? Here, the Europeans and the Americans were promising us money, so that was good for us. That was one thing. Another thing was, as for the explanation of the PLO as to why they signed the agreement, and I heard it from many people, very high-ranking officials in the PLO, they said, look, what's better, to sit in Tunisia or to sit in Ramallah within Palestine and to continue fighting from within Palestine? Here, at least, we have a foothold. And Oslo gives us something that even the Arab states refuse to give us. 
They gave us autonomy. They gave us security apparatuses. They gave us a state on the ground, indications of sovereignty. And this was presented as an achievement, as an accomplishment by the PLO. Now, of course, when you hear the discussions about Arafat having smuggled people in the trunk of his car, and people are surprised, and Arafat going back on agreements, I can tell you, as one who speaks several languages, among them Arabic, that of all my conversations with PLO high-ranking officials in Arabic, never was I left with the impression that we are heading for a peace agreement with Israel. On the contrary, I kept leaving with the impression that we are heading for a huge conflict. In 1994, I was working for an Israeli newspaper and I was sent to Jericho to cover the Palestinian police going into Jericho. And I went with another Jewish Israeli journalist, I won't mention him by name. And we waited there. Suddenly buses full of people wearing uniform came, military uniform. And we saw from the windows AK-47 rifles. And when these people got off the bus and started shooting in the air and the celebrations began, I started to interview some of them. First of all, they introduced themselves not as Palestinian police officers, but as Fedayeen as liberation war fighters. I spoke to some of them and I quoted them with names and I asked them, what do you say about the peace agreement? And most of them looked at me as if I was stupid. And they said, what are, they to what are you talking about? And I said, there's a peace agreement. He said, look, we came here to Palestine to continue with the struggle with, from within Palestine. I asked them, but what about coexistence? They said, no one talked to us about coexistence. We are the Fedayeen. It is our job to fight. We are the Palestinian revolution. And they remained loyal to that and I can understand them. I have no claim against them. I'm talking about the Palestinian leadership. Now, there's worse. The Palestinians were so clear about their views, about what they were saying. Those who did not want to hear were the media in Israel and the foreign press, the foreign, the international media. Also the diplomats, by the way. I remember at the time I wrote a paper with all these interviews and the headline was a nightmarish piece. And it was hard for me to convince my editor to publish this article. She's a Jewish Israeli. And she said, look, what's happening? Why are you bringing these voices? This is a time of peace. Instead of bringing me positive stories, you're bringing me these weird expressions about armed conflict, about the Palestinian revolution. And I said, look, I couldn't find a single person who talked about the peace process. I'm bringing you what there is. I'm bringing you images. I'm bringing you names. If you want to publish it, great. If not. And then she did. And it was hard for me. But most of my friends and colleagues in Israel, the Jewish ones, looked at me as if I want to ruin, to rain down on their parade, to ruin their party. Some of them asked me if I belong to the Israeli right wing, if I maybe was getting paid by Jewish organizations who object and oppose to the Oslo process, and I said no. Now, the same is true. It continued. 
with the Israeli and foreign media when it came to the messages conveyed by the Palestinian Authority to the Palestinian public. The messages were so clear. There was no education for peace or coexistence. But the, on the contrary, there was no switch in the narrative, in the, in the rhetoric of the Palestinian Authority. I felt, having followed the Palestinian media before and after the Oslo process, that we were talking about the same terminology, the same narrative, the same line. Nothing had changed. The only thing that did change, by the way, was that Oslo gave them more televisions, more radio stations, more newspapers, through which and weapons too. By the way, the matter of the weapons and the security apparatuses was also obtained by many from the PLO. It was also viewed as another accomplishment. I remember that until 1993 or 1994, I would go around Gaza a lot. I would go to Janine and Nablus. Once the BBC asked me to help them film a documentary in Janine in 1991 and 1992 and I was told Khaled it's your job to find the, the Black Panther members they said okay we want to interview these guys from the Black Panthers I managed through my friends in Janine to find this group it was then called the Black Panthers. We went there, we met these guys, and they said, listen, we have a problem. And they said, what's the problem? And they said, we couldn't find weapons. That was back in 1991, late 1991. And I said, they said, yes. In this entire area, there's maybe two, three rifles, couple of guns, and they go from one unit to another. Maybe if you come back in a week's time, we'll get some weapons, and then you can take pictures of us, or you can take a film us. And if I look at things today, I don't know. By the way, I still go around the same places in Ramallah. Right now, I don't know any single Palestinian person who doesn't have a weapon at home, at least one. And that, of course, is thanks to Oslo. And that's what made the situation so dangerous. I don't know of an Israeli Arab, by the way, who doesn't have a weapon at home. Yes, because people see that Israel is weak, that Israel does not object to it, and so that encourages people. And what happens there will go here, and what is going on here will go to the other side too, because when they realize we're weak, if they realize we don't, we lack governance, if they don't see a desire of Israel to take care of these issues, then, just to sum up this point, the incitement by the Palestinian Authority increased following the Oslo Accords, and that is why we are where we are now. One of the reasons why Hamas is stronger is because of the Palestinian Authority's incitement against Israel, but also the corruption. These are the two reasons why Hamas has grown stronger, and on the, both of these fronts, these both, both of these things still continue to exist. They have not disappeared, and that is why the situation is, I don't know where we're headed, I'll tell you the truth. I am very worried, very concerned about what I see. People are saying Abu Mazen doesn't control, doesn't govern, he doesn't want to govern, but there is a difference. Because when a person says something bad about Abu Mazen, he'll send 200 officers to arrest him. But if someone goes out and carries out a terrorist attack against the settlers, they say, we say, oh, well, what can we do? Abu Mazen has no control. So what can we say? Is he, so we have to decide, is he there or is he not there? How is it that he has 60,000 police officers and security apparatuses if he doesn't control, if he doesn't govern and this whole amount of weapons? I think that that is the question that needs to be asked, that Israel needs to be asked. Israel must decide decide what it is it wants. The Palestinians, by the way, are clear, much clearer than Israel is. Thank you very much, Khalid.
Right, further to Khaled's last question, I recommend reading the latest article that I wrote that explains why Israel intentionally allows this reality to develop because Israel is afraid of what will happen if something terrible happens to the PA, if it collapses, what will happen to the security cooperation. It's not even clear how effective it is. And Israel continues to dream that the, that the PA is a future partner for peace, and it's not the case. The PA has never done anything, and you asked when we w when we wake up. I've been the intelligence. I was the intelligence officer of the Central Command, and I uh, support. I, I was an advisor for the research unit in the IDF, and I said that there is no sign of education for peace among the and within the Palestinian society, and that is what caused Bogi, head of Amman, to change his mind about the future of the relations with the Palestinian Authority. Authority, and that's what allowed us to be prepared for the second intifada so that we wouldn't be caught by, as, by surprise as, as we often are. But there was really no, no one was paying attention at the time when Barak took office. Yair uh, uh, accuses Barak of killing the peace. But even beforehand, before Oslo, he realized that what the Palestinians were planning was to it was to achieve their independence on a platter of blood. As he said, they talked about entering a significant military campaign in which the Palestinians hope to force the, the, the diplomatic conditions that they want upon us and making it a forceful process. And Bar Barak realized that he understood even before Oslo was signed, he realized that that was the case, and he said so at the famous government meeting, as we saw in the protocols. He talked about the holes in the cheese and how that would cause significant problems. And nevertheless, nothing has changed today, and we are continuing to close our eyes as we continue within this reality. And I want to thank Martin, who's here, and I really, I highly recommend read his conversation, reading his conversation with Chagai Marom on the day when the Oslo Accords were signed, and he said to, he described exactly what was going to happen, and Marom said why you should be optimistic, and he talked about who knows what kind of peace awaits us, and Martin explained, but it's exact. You're you're talking about the exact opposite of the reality. Reality is going to be opposite, and I suggest that we meet in ten years from now and see who's right. And ten years later, it was 2003 in the midst of the second intifada. So that was the bitter reality that was that that we encountered. And the victims are Israel, the Palestinians themselves. Khalid, you didn't talk. You mentioned the live, their living conditions, but didn't talk about it in depth. You talked about the, what the the Fatah people that are said to take care of people who talk about the problems. They suffer as well. Everyone suffers. The only people that were able to wake up from this to come to emerge from this difficult reality and say that we've suffered enough. Let's move on from here are the Sunnis, the, the pragmatic Sunni countries that said enough, let's sign the Abraham Accords. And everyone else continued to suffer. Thank you very much.